Hey guys, good evening. It's Pastor Mike, His Grace Church, right here in beautiful San Antonio, Texas, man, where we're touching lives, changing hearts. His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation. And man, tonight's not going to be any different. So let's go ahead and uh, open with a word of prayer, then we'll get right into the Word of God this evening. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that your Word is alive, because Father, you're alive. And so it's active, powerful, sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we thank you, Father, that as your word goes forth tonight, that it will produce fruit, some 30, some 60, even some 100. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here with us tonight. And I just thank you that as we look into the word that you'll teach through me, that you'll speak things into people's hearts that there be revelation, that Father God, that not one person will leave this place tonight without a glimpse of, of the Word of God uh, in their life and how it can change them. And we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to kind of, it's been several weeks since we were together. Um, last week we were all not here, so let's just do a quick review of what we have already looked at. We're going to continue uh, looking at faith and trusting in the unseen. And so um, and we're going to continue to look at how we as believers can trigger or facilitate healing by applying our faith. Now, this is back to the basics on health and healing. And we have been studying this for some time. And so we looked at Oh, a little while ago, how God can initiate healing on our behalf, meaning that in his sovereignty, through the nine gifts of the Spirit, uh, he, can, he can bring health and redemption and healing to our bodies. But what happens if the water isn't moved, per se? Can we then facilitate uh, healing on our behalf? Can we as believers facilitate that? We've been looking at the answer, and the answer is indefinitely yes, because um, <clears throat> there are a multiplicity of ways that we can do that. And if you haven't been with us, and this is your first time with us, then I encourage you to go back into our, um, um, onto our website under our resources tab, and you can pick this series up at any place. There's um, a plethora of material out there under... Uh, this particular series. So we're not going to go back and do a lot of review, but we are going to do just a little bit this evening. So we found out that faith pleases God. And the Bible tells us that in most of the healings that Jesus performed in his ministry, it was res in response to a believer's faith or to the believer's faith. And so um, what we found out in our last study that is that we can exercise our own faith. We also found out that faith is a language, and language is part of our own culture here, and it's, it's how we communicate. And so when it, it's kind of like the way that heaven talks. Faith is, is heaven language, and if it's the language of heaven, then it's also part of the culture of heaven. And if we're part of the kingdom of heaven, then it has to be part of our culture as well. And, you know, we looked at how, you know, they're not talking about death in heaven. They're not talking about aches and pains in heaven. And so what we saw then that if we want the culture of heaven on the earth, then we need to learn how to speak the language of heaven. And so we're going to pick up this evening in... Um, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. It says, so then faith comes by hearing. Faith comes. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. Faith says the same thing that the word of God says. That's what faith does. It says the same thing that the Word of God says. And faith begins, Smith Wigglesworth said, faith begins where the will of God is known. Where do we find the will of God being made known? In His Word. So faith begins 
where the will of God is made known. And faith says the same thing that the word of God says. They don't contradict each other. And so it's sad, though, uh, that there are so many believers who talk unbelief and they take up sides against God's word. And unbelief is taking up a different side than God's word. It's speaking contrary to what God says. Believing the word of God is agreeing with the word of God, trusting the word of God. But when we, when we are in unbelief, we talk against the belief or the, the promises of the word of God, such as, well, healing might be for sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, but it's not for me. I tried it. It doesn't work. Well, that's unbelief because there's nowhere in the word of God that says healing when appropriated through faith will not work. Quite the contrary. Faith always reassures us that the promises of God are yes and amen and that we can have them. That's why it says in the, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 1, that now faith is. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things that we cannot see. So faith is always present tense, and it is now. Now faith is. It is the substance, the substructures to our hopes. Without hope, faith has nothing to latch on to. And so many times we're hoping to be healed, and that's a good place to start. But we begin to declare the word of God, and we begin to cover that hope with the promise of God until the reality of that promise is real in our life. How long does that take? until it's done. Sometimes it may take just a short time. Sometimes it may take a while. But you continue to declare the word of God. You continue to put the word of God into the atmosphere. You begin to speak the word of God and it will not come back void. It says in Isaiah 55. It will not come back void. It will not come back without accomplishing what has been sent out to do. What are you sending the word of God out to do? Are you sending it out and covering the word of God for your health and healing? Then it's not going to come back without accomplishing that which is sent out to do. And so when we talk about unbelief, many times and people wonder why the word of God doesn't work for them. And another interesting point within the scripture, Romans 10, 17, is this. Is nowhere is it stated when we, look at it, when we look at this, that faith will not work. It doesn't say, you know, it only works for some. And it might work for you, but it's just a roll of the dice. Faith always works because faith is present tense. What do you do when your faith is weak? What do you do when maybe you don't believe the promise to the full extent that you can re receive the reality of that promise? You continue to declare the word of God in that arena. You continue to speak the word of God because it says right here, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith will, the Bible tells us that every person has been given a measure of faith. So when you say you have no faith, then you're, you're, you're just saying that what God said in his word is untrue. But the Bible says that we've all been given a measure, a starting block of faith. What we do with that then is up to us. If we want to increase our faith, which is possible, then we have to get into God's word and we have to begin to find the promises and begin to declare those promises over our life until the reality of those promises become real to us. So when we begin to declare God's word, we're going to begin to build confidence in God. You know, something else that builds confidence is stories and testimonies of other people, man. I tell you what, because when I hear what God does for other people, sometimes I think to myself, well, God will do it for them. I know he'll do it for me. And so, and this concept of complete confidence or faith in God's promises produces results. 
it produces results, and it's scriptural. Because we see in Mark chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. Do you realize that when we're trusting the word of God, that we're really trusting God? Hebrews, uh, not Hebrews, um, I can't, ex oh, and I don't have my phone. Um, the Bible says, let me put it this way, that the Word of God is alive. I'm going to need my iPad. I didn't bring my phone, so I need my iPad, Ben. The Word of God is alive, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Let me, I'm going to, Thank you. I want to look at that scripture real quick. Let me get to my... It's Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between the soul and spirit, between the joints and the moral. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And I like this part that says the word of God is alive. It's alive. What makes it alive? God is alive. My words are alive because I'm alive. So God is alive. What does it mean to be alive? Well, obviously, if I'm alive, I'm not dead. Right? God's not dead, meaning that he's still in existence and in operation. And because he's in existence and operation, his word is in existence and operation. He is present tense, and God is not past tense. So his words are present tense. He is active. Notice what it says in the Amplified here of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, which is the completeness of a person and of both the joints of the marrow, which is the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts, the intents of the heart. His word is living because it is living. His word is living and active because it's alive. It's full of his power. His word is full of his power. It's making it uh, uh, operative energizing and effective. It's active, meaning that it's engaging. It's ready to engage in physically energetic pursuits. God's word is ready to engage in whatever it is called upon. His word is ready to occupy, attract, participate, or become involved in whatever it is predestination to do, predestinated to do. That's God's word. Whatever we send it out to do, it's going to do. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, It is the same with my word. I send it out. And it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper every word that I send it. That's what God says about his word. When God's word goes out, it will always produce fruit. And it will accomplish what is sent out to do, and it will succeed. Notice that. It will always produce fruit. If you need fruit, if you need the fruit of healing, you need to sow the word of God in the area of healing. You need to begin to speak the word. You need to begin to declare the word. You need to, to read the word. Find your 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 
scriptures that you could stand. I always believe that God, when we're standing in the promises, we have a plethora of scriptures we can always work off of, but God always gives you a scripture which becomes rhema, which becomes alive, which becomes active to you. It's just something about it that when you speak it, it builds. You can feel on your insides begin to move. You can feel faith begin to arise. So, Jesus said this again, have faith in God. Have faith in God's ability. Or another translation says, have the same kind of faith as God. What kind of faith did God have? He had the faith to move mountains. He has the faith to create. Faith moves, actively moves things in your life. What will faith, when you believe in God for health and healing, what will faith move sickness and disease out of your life? It's possible, folks. It's not a figment of, of, of our imagination. We're not into mind science. God's Word says we can have it. It's part of the covenant. If it's part of the covenant, we have a right then to declare that it's mine. Jesus provided that covenant, signed it in His blood. We have a legal right to these things. It's not hoping that God will do something for you. You have legal right to these things. Jesus provided them in the contract, signed, sealed, and delivered by his blood. So he's not doing something because, you know, he just, you're just asking for it. It's rightfully yours. Because it's rightfully yours, you need to, to claim what's yours. I just read some guys, somebody in California won the Powerball. I'm going to almost guarantee you he's going to claim what's rightfully his, which is the billion dollars or the million dollars, whatever he won. It's his. Nobody can take it away from him. It's his. He has to claim it, though. The only way he won't get it if he doesn't go to the lottery ticket office and redeem his ticket. Jesus redeemed the ticket that says you are healed. You are already healed. He presented the ticket to the Father in the form of the covenant, signed in his blood, it wasn't a lottery. It was a predestined thing that Jesus did when he went to the cross. He purchased our salvation. He redeemed us from sickness and disease and eternal separation from God. This isn't a freebie. This is a covenant. This is a contract that Jesus provided that you have to claim the rights and privileges to. So have faith in God. Jesus went on in verse 23, I tell you the truth, you can say to the mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. Now you have to understand, he's speaking some things here. We read this all the time, and we just see it's Jesus, but how would you like to be the disciple standing there, listening and hearing this for the first time? This man's crazy. He said, if I'll speak to a mountain be lifted up and thrown in the sea, and I believe it'll happen, it'll happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. And I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Oh, I, I, I could pray for healing. Yes, you can pray for healing, and if you believe you receive it, it's yours. It's yours. It's a completed work. It's a provision of the contract that Jesus provided under the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. But faith's foundation is the Word of God. If it's not in the Word, faith has nothing. I mean, faith will grab a hold of the promises of God. And you have a right to walk in the blessings of Abraham because God provided, according to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, that Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us so that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. We have a right 
to walk in the blessings. I, I sometimes think we treat it as, well, you know, it's kind of like a unique privilege. We get the blessings. It's a right. You need to understand it's a right. Not too long ago, we, Pastor Kim and I, had to get the rights and privileges. Uh, and we talked about this several Sundays ago. What are the rights and privileges? Uh, the rights, uh, not, not the privileges, but the rights of the parents uh, in the life of a minor here in the state of Texas. What are our rights? You need to know. And so what do we do? We went to the state of Texas's website and downloaded that information. So that when my teenage son says, well, you, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And, and I can hold up this piece of paper and emphatically state that's not my responsibility or this is my responsibility. And this is how and what we will adhere to. These are the rights and privileges of a parent in Texas. And so if I hadn't researched that, that information could have been used against me to manipulate a circumstance or situation. But once I had that piece of paper, there was truth in that paper, and that paper declared what my rights as a parent were. That's what the Word of God is. It has the same authority as God speaking it. And so, as Kim and I had, Pastor Kim and I had to go and get this information, you're, we had to seek it out. Now, how, how many, that when you go to the state of Texas website, unless you are looking for something specific, you could be wandering for days looking for information. And so when you go to the Word of God and you have a specific topic, you can research it out. You can find out the information that's necessary for you to walk in that promise. What is your right? What is your privilege? That information is found solely in the Word of God. Once I have that information, just like the adversary that had come against, you know, Pastor Kim and I in our house was going to tell us how things were going to be. We are going to declare what we were going to do for them. We held up that piece of paper, and that piece of paper said, no, no, oh, no, it's not going to be like that. How were we able to speak with that type of boldness? Because we saw what the state told us we had. And so when that individual began to speak, in an unmannerly and unproductive manner and began to declare something utterly different than what the state said we had to provide, we had that information. And the Word of God is the same thing when the devil comes and says, oh no, you're not going to get healed. When people tell you healing is passed away with, you have, the, you have the covenant of the living God and what God has said in His Word. And when He speaks His Word, it is true, it is yes, and it's amen. And Numbers tells us that He's a God that cannot lie. <coughs> Excuse me. Did he say it and will he not do it? So faith, faith's foundation is the word of God. Now something else interesting. Is this. If faith's foundation is the word of God. Was, was Jesus not the Word of God. Jesus was and is the Word of God. John chapter 1, verse 14. So the Word became human. Notice that. The Word of God became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So the Word of God 
for a specific dispensation became human. And John, who was writing this, said, I've seen his glory, and I've seen the glory of the Father's one and only Son. You know, faith is like a house. It's, it, it has to be built on a strong foundation because if it's not, it's not going to stand the tests and trials that are going to come through the storms of life. And that home, when there's, when there's weather or winds or whatever, it will not hold up. Reminds me of the three little pigs, right? Huff and puff, and they blew the house down because it wasn't built on a solid foundation. Faith's foundation is built on the Word of God. And you can't build a great faith life without it. And I think the best part of this truth is, is that the Word of God will never fail. We may fail, things may fail, but the Word of God will never fail. Its success rating stands at 100%. And we can always use our faith then to receive from God. How do we do that? It's simple. We simply stand on God's Word and thank Him for our perfect health and healing. Yeah, but I don't see it. That doesn't mean you haven't received it. I know that's a, a quandary of quandwums, <laughs> but the reality of it is when we pray, we believe that we have it. And then we have to act like the Word of God is so. I remember sitting under Brother Hagin back in the early 80s. I was at a prayer seminar with him, and man, and he was up there, and his voice was all gravelly, and he was hacking in a coffin, and he just kept saying, I'm not sick. I'm not sick. And I thought to myself, well, obviously you've missed it because I can hear it. I can see it. He says, the symptoms are there, but I'm not taking them on. I'm not taking ownership of them. Within a day or so, he was back at the pulpit. He was absolutely normal. He didn't declare the symptoms. He declared the Word of God. Do you get that? We have this tendency to always declare the symptoms. But instead of declaring the symptoms, we need to be speaking the Word of God. People say, are you sick? I say, well, I have symptoms that are contrary to the Word of God, but I'm healed. <coughs> By His stripes, I've been healed. Symptoms are a lie. They're contrary to the Word of God. So we simply stand on God's Word, and we thank Him. We thank Him for our perfect health and healing. Now, in the ministry of Jesus, we see emphasis on the exercising of one's own faith. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 says, He personally carried our sins in His body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what was right, what is right. By His stripes, we are healed. Does that sound like future tense to you? Does that sound like in the great by and by we will be healed? Or does that sound past tense? You were healed. You are healed. So, what do we know about healing? What do we know about our healing? We know that by the stripes of Jesus, the wounds or stripes of Jesus, we are healed. Are. We are healed. This scripture is in the past tense, which means what? It means it's already done. We're already healed. And if we're healed, if we were healed when Jesus went to the cross, what would be the most accurate way that we could state it now in the day in which we live? By his stripes, we are healed. We're healed. Not we will be healed, not we might be healed, but we are healed. 
Remember what we read here in Mark chapter 11 that Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. You have to have faith in the covenant. You have to have faith in the promise. God said you are healed. If you are healed, then why aren't you accepting that as fact? Why aren't you declaring what God has already said about you? Why are you declaring the symptoms which are contrary to the word of God more so than declaring what God said? God said you're healed. That's pretty simple. It's done. In his eyes, it's a finished work. It's complete. Over. We are healed. Notice Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We want to look at a few scriptures. Some people brought to Jesus, verse 2, a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, notice that? Seeing their faith. That tells me faith can be seen. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be encouraged, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? And Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why, have you, why, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on the earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up and went home. Fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen, and they praised God for giving humans such authority. Hmm. Notice verse 2 again. Seeing their faith. Matthew 9, verse 22 says, Jesus turned around when he saw her and said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. Whose faith? Her faith. And the woman was healed at that moment. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29 says, Then he touched their eyes. And said, because of your faith, it will happen. Whose faith? Jesus' faith? His mighty mountain-moving faith? No. Their faith. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 28 says, Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted and, your, and her daughter was healed instantly. Your faith. Not Jesus' faith. Their faith moved that mountain. Mark chapter 2 and verse 5. Jesus seeing, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. He saw their faith. Mark 5 verse 34 says, And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your faith. Your faith has made you well. Mark chapter 10 and verse 52. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. Your faith. This isn't mountain moving faith that Jesus used. This was the individual's faith. This was their trust and confidence in God's ability. Have faith in God. They not only had faith in God, but they knew that if they could just get to Jesus, something wonderful would happen. And we can go on looking in Luke's Gospels, and in 5 verse 20, 7, 50, 8, chapter 8, verse 48, 17, verse 19, 18, verse 42. And we could find the same account of Jesus declaring, by their faith, by their faith, by their faith, they were made whole. You see, you don't need other people's faith. You don't need God to move the water so you can step into the pool. But what you do need is trust and confidence in God's ability to do what he said he would do in his word. Faith. And so, in these verses... 
It was the end, in the end, it was the individual's faith that Jesus was commending. What was it that brought about these instances of healing in these people's lives? It was their faith. So when we say God didn't initiate healing, the preacher didn't, there wasn't any anointing. The interesting thing about this is that we can trust God and believe God for our own healing. We can grow our faith to receive the promises of God. How does faith come in Romans chapter 10, verse 17? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we're going to grow in faith, we're going to have to study the word. We're going to have to, to be in the word. We're going to have to be not so much consumed by the word of God, but we have to let it breathe in us. Faith begins where the will of God is known. And if you don't know what the will of God is, you have no way to attach hope to that promise. A lot of people hope that one day they might be feeling better. They might be healed. But because they don't know the promises of God, which are yes and amen, concerning the subject of healing, they're putting their hope in doctors. They're putting their hope in medicine. My hope is in God above. I'll use the medical facilities and the practices that are available, but, but in the end, the word of God, which is what, what, what richly engulfs me and lives and breathes on the inside of me because it's, a, it's alive, because God's alive. And if he's alive, his word's alive. And if God said, I'm healed, those are words are life. And not death. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says, And we are confident that he hears us. Isn't that great? When we pray, God, we have this confidence he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Do you think asking God for something he's already given us pleases him? Do you think asking God for something that Jesus already provided pleases him? Yes. Yes, it does. And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. Isn't that interesting? So many people, when they pray for healing, don't believe God will give it to them. But yet we find in 1 Peter 2.24 that he's already gave it to us. It's not something he's going to give it. He's already gave it. The difference is we are not walking in the redemptive reality of that promise yet. But as we continue to declare over our bodies, you know, one of my favorite scriptures is if that same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives and dwells on the inside of me, he'll also quicken and make alive my mortal body. Think about that. Think about the explosive powerhouse, the nuclear, I call it a nuclear explosion a nuclear reactor of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me. One of the things I believe, I, I think I know about nuclear reactors is their power is unlimited. That's why we harness it. If it's left unchecked, it can be very devastating. But when it is brought into containment, it's very useful. That, that same nuclear power that's living on the inside of you, that same explosive power that raised Jesus Christ. You know, when we think about the resurrection of Jesus, we just think the Holy Spirit went down there and, you know, nice, gentle, slow resurrection from the dead. I believe when, when God raised Jesus from the dead, there was such an explosion of power that it brought Jesus Christ back to life in a moment, in an instant of time. And it happened so quickly that Satan didn't even know what the heck happened to him. Amen. That same spirit that raised, that, that grabbed Jesus from the jaws of death, hell, and the grave and stood him back up to life is the same spirit that's living on the inside of you that will quicken 
that will make alive. That resurrection power is on the inside of you. Will, will, will resonate from the very inner part of your being and your spirit to the physical external part of your body. Woo! Amen. Hallelujah. Draw upon that power. It wasn't just placed there so you could have such nice, warm, fuzzy feelings from time to time. It was placed inside of you for a purpose. You are alive unto God. Our outward man may be decaying day by day, but our inward man is growing stronger by the minute. So that when we speak under the authority and the unction of the Word of God, we expect not hope, we expect something to happen. So if we ask anything according to God's will, what do we know? We know with confidence, confidence, assurance, trust that he hears us. And he'll give us what we ask. Faith is knowing. While there may be doubt in our heads sometimes, our hearts still know with certainty that God and his word cannot lie. You see, we don't believe that we're healed because we believe in some mind science. We believe we are healed based upon God's word and the work of Jesus Christ at the cross. By faith, we thank God for our healing. By faith, we walk above and not beneath. By faith, we are the head and not the tail. By faith, we decree that God's word is alive, active. By faith. By faith, you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You trusted in something you could not see and you believed in something you had no idea what it was, but you wanted it. By faith, grab a hold of the promises of God. By faith, walk them out. By faith, like a dog that, that's got a bone, a ham bone, that won't let it go when you try to take it out of its mouth. You hold on to it by faith, with tenacity. Too often we're just, ah, say la vie, say la vie. if I get it, I get it, if I don't. That's not faith, folks. Faith is a confidence that what you have asked for, you have received already. And Jesus has already provided health and healing in the covenant. It is your right to declare, demand it, and expect it to manifest in your body. So if there's nobody else that will pray, if the elders can't come, if the waters haven't moved, glory to God, the word of God will never fail. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, as he will be forever. As he walked the earth, he was the word of God in the flesh. And we have something even better. Because Jesus could only be at certain places at certain times. We have something better. We have his word. We have his word. We can access his word, which is just like him speaking it. Peace, be still. Hallelujah. We have the authority. Because Jesus gave us that authority. When we speak in the name of Jesus, all three worlds listen. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things beneath the earth, the Bible tells us. What are you speaking? What are you declaring? Are you building yourself up? Or are you just letting things go? Are you declaring God's word? Do you have that word like a dog at a bone and you can't get it out of his mouth? Or are you just kind of like, uh, maybe, maybe not. Faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the Word of God. Begin to declare the Word. I believe revelation will come as you speak the Word. Faith will rise in your heart to receive the promise of God. If you're looking for it to work any other way, it's not. Faith begins where the will of God is known. And if you don't know what the will of God is concerning healing, if you don't know what the word of God is concerning your finances, then all these things will control you. But there comes a place where you stand up and begin taking control because you have confidence. The confidence that God's word is alive because God is alive. I'm a God that cannot lie, he said. If I said it, I'm going to do it. And if you're not sure he's going to do it, then you need to get into his word and see how many times he really did do it compared to how many times he didn't do it. And you're going to find that he's always fulfilled the promise that he's made. He's not a covenant breaker. He's not a truce maker. He's a covenant keeper. He keeps his covenants. He kept his covenants through generations to generations from generation to generation. And the Bible says, I'm a God that keeps covenant with my people. You're his people, and you're in covenant. And under that covenant is health and healing. So begin to stand up, rise up, and declare what's already yours. What is your right? I have the right to be healthy and whole. I have the right to walk above and not beneath. I have the right to be the top and not the bottom. I have the right to have my storehouses full. These are rights. But if you're just hoping it's going to happen, I'm hoping I'm going to win the lottery someday. That's just a hope. Oh yeah, I can dream big if I just win the lottery. But I have a better promise. God says he'll fill my storehouses. I have a sure promise. He'll take care of me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have a sure promise that by his stripes I was healed. I'm already the healed. Not going to be. I am. Stand up and declare the word of God. Stand up and put your armor on. Stand up and put that word out in the air and let it begin to fight your battles for you. And then see what Jesus will do. He's already done everything he's going to do concerning healing, but you need to see your faith manifesting the promises of God, which are yes and amen. Amen? amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank the interest your word has given and brought life. And tonight, Father, I've just simple, simply just proclaimed the word of God the most, the best I could with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so I thank you that lives are being ministered to, hearts are being ministered to, lives are being changed. I thank you that that word is going forth and it's not going to come back void. I thank you that people are, are hearing it and grasping a hold of the, the importance of your word tonight, Father, to speak your word, to declare your word over every circumstance of life and to keep doing it until they see the promise fulfilled. I thank you, Father. I thank you that you've given us your word and how precious it really is. That your word is, is you speaking through us. Your word is alive. It's active, powerful. Thank you for your word tonight. And there be, Father, if there be any within the sound of my voice tonight, Holy Spirit, I, I ask you, to convict them of the need of the Savior, Jesus. That your word will, will show them the necessity of salvation in their life. Hallelujah. You know, you may be, I know everybody here, but if you're watching through any one of our social media platforms, maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity right now. The Bible says that 
faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We proclaim the word of God. Jesus said that he'll confirm his word with signs and wonders following. One of the greatest signs and wonders is the gift of salvation. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. It's very simple. Same principle. We declare with our mouth what we believe in our heart, that Jesus was raised from the dead, and we will be saved. We won't maybe be saved. We will be saved. What does that word saved mean? It's a Greek word, sodizozo, means to be made whole. It gives reference to that without Jesus, we're incomplete. We're incomplete because we're separated from the Father, who is eternal life. Jesus came to redeem us, meaning he ransomed us out of, he bought us out of eternal separation from God, eternal death, and gave us eternal life, made us part of his family so that we could walk as a child that's blessed beyond measure. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I encourage you to just pray this prayer with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. And because of that, from this moment forward, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, let me be the first to welcome you into the kingdom of God. I know something miraculous and wonderful is happening to you at this very moment. You may not understand exactly all that's going on. And so Pastor Kim and I, to help you, we put together a very short video series called The New Birth. It's about... Mm, 10 videos long, and they're about five to seven minutes. They're very short clip uh just to help you understand what's occurring. I know it's just awesome. It's wonderful. It's miraculous. But what is it? Check out our, our video, uh, New Birth video series at, uh, on our website at www.hgc.church forward slash resources under our digital resources. It's going to be the first one up there. And then I encourage you to also to get into a good Bible-believing church. And if you're in the San Antonio area, we believe His Grace Church is such a place, man. We're a smaller group of believers where everyone can know your name. Man, we're a family here, meaning that we socialize, we do things together, we have church together, we do outside things out, outside. I mean, we're a family. And uh, come be a part of the family of God. At, here at His Grace Church. Your spiritual family is important. You get to meet m new people, different group of friends. Man, but it's wonderful. And so, again, I encourage you to come be a part of what we're doing here at His Grace Church. We're, we're, we're training, we're mobilizing, we're helping you develop and grow in your spiritual journey. Glory to God. And then I also encourage you to join me Sunday morning for our series on Hall of Fame, and we're going to be looking at um, Moses this week. We're going to be looking at Moses. 10.30 a.m. is our Sunday morning worship celebration kickoff time right here on campus at 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway. I encourage you, to come on, be a part, step out, come join us, meet some people. We'd love to meet you for sure. So, I know that God has something unique to say to you this week. And Pastor Kim and I believe that, that our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. I'm Pastor Michael Pillmore. This is His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation. I'll see you right back here Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. for our Sunday morning worship celebration.